welcome to Ray Howe Academy on Air. This podcast is a way for us to present non-technical information related to Ray Howe in a Q&A format with industry experts. I'm Max Rohr, the Ray Howe Academy Manager for North America. Our guest today is John Siegenthaler. He's a licensed professional engineer. He is the principal of Appropriate Designs. John also wrote the books Modern Hydronic Heating and Heating with Renewable Energy, which are two great textbooks for best heating and cooling practices. Welcome, John. Uh, Good morning, Max. Good to be with you. So we've seen a lot of cool new products come out in the last 10 years that are well-suited for hydronic systems. How do you determine what heat sources would be best for a radiant project now? Well, as you point out, there's a lot of choices. Um, you know, one of the one of the things I've, I've told people for years is almost anything that can provide warm water could potentially be a source for a hydronic heating system. But going back to you know practical situation, I'll start with local fuel availability. Um, I live in rural upstate New York. A, a lot of areas up here do not have natural gas available, so that that is out, and conventional fuels, uh, fuel oil, propane, electricity, they're available in most places. Uh, Of late, we're working on systems, uh, biomass-based heating systems, uh, some of which use uh, split cordwood, some use pellets, and others use chips. And, And especially in those situations, we have to look at what fuel availability we have. So I'll start with that. And also another local factor that quickly comes into the decision is, can can we find local people that can install and service this equipment? If we go with a, a very exotic heat source and we've only got uh, very limited uh, availability of installers, many times they're simply not familiar with the hardware. So as an engineer, if I spec that into a project, uh, I, I know there's going to be some some difficulty there in, in terms of resistance on the part of the installer to work with the product and perhaps the um, a, if a problem does develop uh, an unwillingness to get out there and service it. So, so fuel availability, local installation service availability, and then reliability is another factor too. Um, again, there are some very high-end, fairly sophisticated approaches that could be used as potential heat sources, but we want to look at reliability. Uh, Most people are not into the technology behind their heating system. They're they're into the comfort that it provides. Uh, Rarely, but occasionally, we'll find somebody that really wants to uh, work on the edge of the technology envelope, and uh, we're willing to do that as long as, uh, again, as long as they understand what that implies and and also uh, that there are arrangements for service on it. And we'll look at the owner's ability to deal with the system too. If it's, uh, you know, perhaps an 80 year old uh, grandmother living by herself, uh, she she probably isn't gonna be a person that's going to want to deal with hiccups now and then on that heating system. We're we're looking at something that's, that's gonna perform well. And then, farther down the list, I do have energy efficiency, but I I put that farther down the list because I I do feel these other factors are very important in terms of getting a satisfied client and designing a system around what their needs are versus what the designer may want to experiment with, so to speak, or what might be in vogue based on the latest product releases and so forth. And I think that probably price consistency um, would factor into that too, because I know that in some places, depending on the year and depending on the price, propane can be the best or the worst option, where if renewables are part of that mix, at least you have some sort of consistency that once you go through the initial hardware costs that you should have the same amount of sun energy or you know earth energy or whatever. Right, right. That, that's a good point. I mean, we've seen, uh, obviously, we've seen the price of, uh, for example, fuel oil over the last two and a half to three years has, has dropped tremendously. And it it has made for 
it has made for a harder sale to customers that are only focused on price. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of a no-brainer if, if that's the only focus. But you, you bring up a good point: long-term, uh, long-term price stability on the fuel, uh, and making sure that that fuel is available. Uh, one of the local struggles that uh, it is getting better, but uh, two or three years ago, one of the local struggles was uh, the availability of pellets near the end of a cold winter where demand for pellets were high. Uh, the local pellet producing companies uh, just don't have large warehouses full of pellets or silos full of pellets. So uh, again, if we're designing a system around pellets, we want to make sure that we've got stability of relative stability on price, but also stability on, a, on availability of the fuel. Yeah. So what do you think the hydronics market in North America will look like in 10 years? It's a good question. Uh, it's, it's fun to speculate about these things. Uh, I definitely think you'll see a higher percentage of renewable energy in the mix. I, I don't think we're going to see the traditional fuels gone by any means, but incrementally higher use of renewables. Uh, most of the states have pretty ambitious uh, renewable portfolios that they're going after. I, I know that's definitely the case in New York State and some of the other New England states. Um, I think heat pumps in various forms are going to become a, a more prominent heat source. Uh, and it, one of the reasons behind that is large-scale renewable electrical generation, uh, wind farms, large-scale uh, solar PV, uh, and also trends in housing markets uh, net zero housing, uh, where the loads are low. And, you know, an interesting thing, when we look at a house sometimes that has a very low heating load, or maybe a, a design load in the range of, let's say, 15 to 20,000 BTUs per hour, even if natural gas service is available to that house, uh, the cost of having the gas meter, the basic service charge associated with having the gas meter on the house might actually be higher than the usage uh, cost of natural gas. So we look at a situation like that and ask the question, is it worth having both the electric meter, which is pretty much a given. Uh, I mean, there are occasional off-grid projects, but most people are going to have utility supplied electricity. But the question is, do you want utility supplied gas, even if it's right there out on the street, if we can work with a heat source like a heat pump and and only have a single utility service to that building and have comparable uh, heating costs. So I, I do think we're going to see a trend towards more electrically driven heat sources uh, and heat pumps in particular, uh, geothermal and also air to water heat pumps are a nice tie in with hydronic systems. Uh, we're already seeing heat pumps being used for water heating and some other ancillary loads like pool heating. So uh, I think that's going to be one of the trends. And another trend is going to be towards progressively lower water temperatures. So that, that has really already been a trend globally, certainly in the European market and the Asian market. Uh, lower temperature distribution systems are, <clears throat> are really necessary to get the best performance from a range of modern heat sources, uh, heat pumps in particular, but hot cotton boilers, and and even in, in biomass, uh, we, we work with the wind gasification boilers and pellet boilers. Now, those boilers are capable of producing higher temperatures. You could run 200 degree water out of a pellet boiler, but one of the components in that system that's critical to make that pellet boiler work properly is a thermal storage tank, a fairly significant thermal storage tank. And it comes down to, from a design standpoint, how low can we discharge the temperature in that thermal storage tank before we have to turn the pellet boiler back on again? We, we want to have long run cycles on those boilers. So low temperature distribution systems allow us to take a tank from maybe 180 degrees all the way down to perhaps 100 degrees. So, so I, I definitely think another trend is going to be towards lower water temperatures. So one of the guidelines that, that I suggest to people, it, it's not an ASHRAE standard. It's really 
not any, it, it doesn't have any legal teeth at this point, but just kind of a self-imposed standard is to design every hydronic distribution system regardless of its heat source so that it can provide design heating load with 120 degree Fahrenheit or less, or I should say, or lower water temperatures at design conditions. And by doing that, you you future-proof that system. If you're, if you're doing a good job with your distribution system, it should last for many decades. It's going to outlast its original heat source, probably its second, maybe even its third heat source. And, you know, obviously looking way ahead in, in the market, we don't know what those heat sources are going to be, but the, the bet is on lower water temperature providing higher performance in whatever those heat sources are. You know, the basic physics isn't going to change. So why not design today for what will be a long-term investment in that distribution system and key idea, low water temperatures. Do you think district heating on kind of a medium scale, um, maybe 20 houses, townhouses or something like that will make a, a comeback? I think so. Uh, it's extensively used in Europe. Uh, there is a new ASTM standard that's been in the works now for close to three years, and, and I believe it is due out. I believe it's due out by the end of this year. Uh, it's ASTM E44, and it is an accuracy standard on thermal metering equipment. I think once that standard's in place, that engineers are going to be more willing to design around the concept of of heat metering, and there's a lot of technical advantages to systems, that, as you described. We will call them a mini district heating system where we've got perhaps a variety of heat sources. Um, uh, I know in Western Canada, uh, in BC, there's been several um, mini district systems that have been designed around biomass boilers with, with gas, uh, gas boilers as a backup, and uh, supplying perhaps to a commercial district area, maybe half a mile to a mile of uh, distance between the heat source and, and, the, and the loads. So yeah, heat metering is, is definitely a technology that is, is going to happen here in North America, and, and I think it'll fit nicely uh, with, you know, the new heat sources, it'll fit nicely with renewable energy. It's, it's kind of interesting that some Renewable energy programs uh, actually require heat metering now from a performance validation standpoint. Uh, I think that that's appropriate, but I also think that aside from performance validation, that it, it encourages energy conservation. Uh, we can design a heating plant around optimal performance on the heat source. And since people pay for what they use, there, there's still going to be an incentive to conserve as opposed to creating a district system where without heat metering, you know, people will, will inherently waste energy. So yeah, heat metering definitely, and, and many district systems are going to be uh, a growing part of the market. Energy Outreach Colorado did, a, they had some some research on submetering just for electrical, and if I remember correctly, they found something like a 30% energy savings when people were actually paying for their share of the energy usage as opposed to just a fraction of the total. So I imagine there would be some, right. some big reductions just being able to legally account for the amount of energy that goes to which unit. What's one of, yeah, what's one of your favorite, so. go ahead. Yeah, the uh, condominium projects, leased office space, apartments, uh, you know, a condo project where you might pay a fixed amount per month for utilities. And, you know, there are going to be situations where people that are, are paying that fixed amount per month may or may not be using the condo. Maybe, for example, maybe they're away for a month and they're still going to pay that amount as opposed to having an actual meter and pay for what you use. Yeah, it's interesting. It's it's not that we really lack the technology to do it. It seems like we just lack the the legal grounds to be able to submeter energy because it's not as well understood, I guess, as it is in in other parts of the world where they've been doing that for longer. 
Yeah, well, there's been standards in Europe. Uh, and my understanding of the ASTM standard that is under development now is that it's essentially a North Americanization, if you will, of the European standard. And I, I think once that standard is in place, engineers will have, if you will, the kind of a legal leg to stand on to justify, yes, we can do that, and this equipment does meet this standard. And, and, and I think that's really a necessary foundation for that market to develop. Yeah, I think so too. So what's one of your favorite hydronics um, success stories? <laughs> uh, well, we've seen a lot of good projects. Uh, one that, that really sticks in my mind, it actually goes back, I, I believe, either to the late 1990s or maybe right after the turn of the century. Uh, you may be familiar with this. I, I know you know Peter Zalasko out yep. there in Chicago. Uh, he did a project that actually won an RPA award in its category, and it was called Harvard Apartments. Uh, do you remember that project, uh, Max? Not specifically, but um, I'm familiar with the name. Yeah, uh, just imagine a, a typical uh, apartment building with maybe uh, 12 apartments on the first floor and to another 12 above it. And what Peter did is uh, he set up a system where the, the mechanical room was on one end of the building and it was a very simple uh, gas-fired uh, atmospheric boiler. And he used a concept that uh, <clears throat> we, we call mini-tube. And what Minitube is, is, is recognizing that a boiler like that at design load conditions can produce relatively high temperature water, so let's say 180 degree water. And each apartment had floor heating. Uh, it was a thin slab installation with, with uh, half-inch PEX stapled down to the floor and then an inch and a half of uh, a gypsum underlayment over that. And <clears throat> So we have a low temperature distribution system combined with a high temperature capable boiler. So we have very large temperature differentials to work with there between the source of the heat and the load. So he was actually able to supply a, all these apartments using one inch pipe. And I believe it was a PEX pipe that he used, went right down the corridor in the ceiling and supplied 180 degree water. And then at the manifold, for each apartment, he set up a mixing station, and he set it up with what's called proportional reset, which is, is it's a concept that isn't really widely used today, but it's, it's the idea that if you're doing boiler reset, and, and I, I should mention that the, the gas-fired boiler does do boiler reset. So at design load, 180 degree water, maybe at half load, maybe 140 degree water, let's say. So he's doing reset on the boiler. You can actually set up a three-way valve, a, what I'll call a dumb valve, not a thermostatic valve and not a motorized valve, but let's say just the body portion of a motorized mixing valve with a manual knob on it. You can set that up so that it receives high temperature water and it mixes it in a certain proportion with the return water coming back from the floor. And what it gives you is a, a, a reset line that is proportional to the boiler reset line. So as the boiler is dropping from, let's say, 180 down to 140, the floor heating might be changing from, let's say, I'll pick a number from 110 down to maybe 95. So we're getting a reset effect, which is, is nice from a comfort standpoint and from consistent heat delivery standpoint. Uh, but we're doing it without putting intelligent, more expensive mixing controls in each of those apartments. So, so what Peter did on this project is he combined the idea of a mini-tube distribution system to keep the pipe sizes very low, very small, and, and hence keep the cost down, and employed this uh, proportional reset technique to make sure the comfort was there. And I know it was a very cost-competitive situation he actually was able to win the project because uh, I think to use his words, he sharpened his pencil and, and used some design techniques that RPA was teaching in some of their courses and still still do. But he put them together in a very, uh, ele I'll, I'll say a very elegant approach, not, a, not an overly complex approach, but an elegant approach that allowed him to get uh, 
to actually get the project price wise. And that, um, yeah, it's kind of an interesting take that it's just a, another parallel shift of the reset curve lower at the unit without the addition of having all the controls and everything that we kind of fall back towards now to have um, digital everything to every corner of the house. Yeah, that's kind of a, a cool concept. Yeah, it's, it, it is. And, you know, that's kind of a spectrum there. As, as you point out today, we have a lot of uh, control capability if we want to use it. And, and there are justified applications certainly for that, but sometimes simple projects using, you know, relatively simple, reliable, I'll say, I'm not sure if I should use the word passive, uh, although that mixing valve really is kind of a passive device. It, it doesn't need to have intelligence to, to accomplish that proportional reset. So the, the elegance that, that I mentioned in the system, what struck me was he was able to use relatively simple concepts, low cost concepts, still achieve good performance, and, and actually get the project to go uh, hydronic as opposed to, you know, perhaps putting a, a PTAC unit in or, or whatever the other uh, bids were, but probably a forced air system of some sort. So sure. it, to me, it represented a lot of uh, good creative thinking. Yeah, that's a good one. In general, what design consideration is most overlooked in a hydronic system? Uh, well, again, de depending on the hardware, but one of the, the concepts that that I don't think is uh, getting as much attention as it deserves is a hydronic system can deliver heat using a, a small fraction of the electrical power required by a forced air system. And, and a good nominal ratio there is about a 10 to 1 ratio. So, for example, to deliver heat in a forced air system through a typical house uh, with a blower having a permanent split capacitor motor, a standard blower, not, not a high efficiency PCM, uh, we might be in the range of 600 to 800 watts of electrical input just, just to move that heat, not to create the heat, but just to move that heat around the building. If that was a hydronic system, we could do that probably in 60 to 80 watts or today with ECM circulators even, even less. And I think it's a concept that, that needs to be brought out in the marketing and the sales of hydronics, the promotion of hydronics, but it's also a concept that designers need to keep in mind because uh, I'm sure you've seen projects as, as I have where a designer might put 20 or 25 circulators on a wall and it looks good, it looks impressive, we've got the circulators all lined up, it makes a great, you know, great uh, photo for the circulator manufacturer, but it's absolutely the wrong approach from the standpoint of energy usage. And the uh, industry as a whole at times gets, gets somewhat fixed on the thermal efficiency of the heat source, you know, be it a, heat, a, a geothermal heat pump or a modcon boiler, whatever it is, and they disregard the energy usage of the distribution system. And, you know, obviously the, the customer is paying for both. So uh, from a design standpoint, to reduce the electrical usage of the distribution system is, is probably one of the more universal concepts that, that could be improved upon. And, and you'll see a big difference between the North American market's attitude on that versus, let's say, the European market's attitude on that. Um, so if I had to pick one, it would it'd probably be that. And a second one that I'll, I'll throw out for thought is proper documentation of custom systems. If, if a contractor is going in and just doing, let's say, very simple, maybe it's a, an oil-fired boiler supplying three zones of baseboard, three circulators, and a zone relay panel, that's a pretty straightforward system, and pretty much any competent hydronics tech should be able to understand that install that service and so forth. But when we get into sophisticated systems with multiple heat sources, uh, many different zones, uh, mixing, uh, thermal storage, lots of controls, that's, that's a, a very customized system. And it's not that we shouldn't do those, we can do those, but when we do those, 
it's very important to create good documentation, uh, good pipe schematics, electrical control schematics, written descriptions of exactly how that system operates. And the idea is not only to document it for proper installation, but to have long-term documentation. So 10, 15, 20 years down the road, when inevitably something needs servicing on that system, there's a roadmap to follow. And you know, even the original designer might not remember how the system was designed, what some of the little uh, technical details were, and they might be out of the picture at that point. So we should document systems so that reasonably competent local technicians can come in, they'll look at the system, they may not initially understand it, but with that documentation on site, they should be able to uh, reference this is what the system is supposed to do when it's operating correctly, observe what it's doing, and then reconcile the difference. So, so providing good documentation is important on these uh, custom systems. Uh, at my last job at Shamrock Sales, it was um, shocking the amount of jobs that we went to, and they had both of those issues. That there was no documentation, and then they also just wanted to cut and paste the heat source without addressing any of the distribution and you would go in and in a lot of those cases it would go that way because the the building owner was in a hurry or they you know wanted a, a to get everything up and running um before their customers were back in town or whatever in the resort communities and um it didn't fix much it was just a a more expensive heat yeah. source and we didn't know where it was going or why it needed to be 180 degrees but that was just the, the easiest way to do it so some of the best contractors that i knew in colorado would take the time and say okay i have to figure out what we're trying to do here or else i'm not going to be able to do it well and sometimes would just have to pass on some of those projects that if you know that there are a bunch of um, unknown factors in the system, you reduce the percentage chance that you have to get it right. You know, you're taking a guess even if you are yeah, really we, good at what you do and have great equipment. Absolutely. Uh, we see it all the time uh, with the biomass boilers now uh, where there are incentive programs in New York State at present to install pellet boilers, and, and they're very attractive incentive programs. So a customer will, or, or a contractor for that matter, will, will kind of picture the situation as we have an existing heating system. Uh, most of the time in upstate New York, uh, in these rural areas, uh, it's usually a baseboard system and either a, a propane or an oil-fired boiler that's been supplying it. And they view it very simplistically as I'm going to set the pellet boiler next to the oil boiler. I'm going to just pipe it in there in parallel, put another pump on it. I'm not even going to go upstairs and look at what the distribution system is, what the heat emitters are. And we get very marginal results that way because, uh, you know, I use the analogy that they're, they're putting a Ferrari racing engine into a uh, Cub Cadet lawn tractor and expecting it to be a great racing machine. Uh, they, they just aren't matching the operating um, characteristics of that heat source to what that distribution system is. And as you point out, you just you can pick whatever you feel is the best boiler or heat pump or solar collector or whatever. And if it isn't compatible with that system, you you know you're you're basically doomed from the beginning. You've got to make sure people understand that it is a system, and in some cases. We have to go upstairs, so to speak. We have to not only assess what's there, but in, in some cases, we need to extend what's there, either more baseboard or perhaps some radiant panel uh, being added so that we can get those water temperatures where they need to be to get the best performance out of that new heat source. Yeah, I think that to bid it properly, you have to look at the, the whole house and not just walk straight into the basement, <laughs> into the mechanical room. So um, yeah. my last and, question and for you. To, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, Max, be prepared to justify why your price is higher if you're if you're going in and assessing that system and you see that there are existing issues that have to be dealt with in order to get the, the right performance on that new heat source. You know, as opposed to just saying this is my bid in, in dollars. 
you know, I, I did an assessment of the project. Um, this is what you have at present. This is what we would like to do to bring it up as a system and, you know, justify it. Uh, so it, it isn't always about uh, beating the next guy in price. It's, it's about providing value and providing professional insight to the customer and spending time with that customer to, to make sure that they see what you're doing is you're acting as a professional should. You're, you're, you're not just saying, I can replace your boiler with whatever for X amount of dollars. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a complete, I'll use the term makeover of your system to bring everything up to where it should be. Yeah, because you could replace a boiler with any other boiler in the world. And if the, the living room has a, a big couch in front of undersized baseboard that's filled with dog hair, something like that, you just, uh, you're not going to make that, that room that much warmer. Correct. So the, uh, the last question I have for you, um, who's your favorite teacher or mentor and why? <laughs> well, I, you know, I know a lot of people and I don't want to single out people within our industry, uh, a lot of people that have done excellent work uh, in, in terms of training. But, in, you know, my thoughts go back actually a long time ago, 1975, when I was, uh, I was in my first and second year in college in engineering, uh, I had a physics professor by the name of Neil Gall, and I'm not sure if he's still living at this point. I've, I've kind of lost track of him. But this guy was uh, uh, extremely neat and consistent with his teaching approach. And, and of course, back then, this is actually even before overhead transparency. This was chalk on, on a chalkboard. But the thing that, that impressed me and stuck with me, uh, consistency. He always went back to the basics. Uh, he always stressed, uh, you know, things like getting the units right when you're doing a calculation and, and not being sloppy. And he, quite honestly, wasn't very tolerant of people that were sloppy uh, in, in terms of grading. So he was somewhat of a feared uh, instructor. But I can remember his lectures, uh, and it's been like 40 years now. Um, I can remember you know, what he described and, and the fundamental principles. So I think that being consistent and, and making, um, you know, being neat with the presentation, using consistent terminology is important. Um, and quite honestly, holding the bar up. Uh, he did that. Uh, I seemed to be able to get on his wavelength, so to speak, and was, uh, I did a, I did fine with him, but there others, uh, honestly, uh, the attrition rate was pretty high at that point, and, and a lot of people blamed him that he was too, too difficult uh, or too, you know, regimented in his approach that he needed to loosen up and, you know, kind of get with the, the times. And he wouldn't do that. And even the administration of the school would look down on him at, at times for this. But as far as learning the material, getting the material across and getting it across in ways that stick with you for life, uh, he, I would have to say, would be one of my favorite instructors. And, and today, uh, another fellow that I've been impressed by, uh, you probably have heard of this guy. His name is Joe Stebrick. Uh, he's, a, uh, he's a building scientist. He's, he's actually a Canadian by birth, but I, I believe he's a, a citizen of the U.S. now. And he, he runs a company called Building Science Corporation out of Massachusetts. And Joe has been around for a long time. Uh, as a building scientist, he's really developed a lot of the modern thinking behind insulation, vapor barriers, air barriers, and how different types of construction perform thermally. And he has been out, uh, he's done a lot of lectures, a uh, very passionate guy, but a very humorous guy too. He, you know, uh, self-deprecating, I think, is the term. <laughs> he, uh, he can really hold your attention. So I'd have to say today, as far as technical training, um, he'd be one that sticks out in my mind. Great. Yeah, I'll have to uh, look up some more of uh, his, his training stuff. So thank you for joining me today. You can find Building. more information from John at hydronicpros.com. You can order his book there and also see upcoming seminars. 
Um, John also does 10-week online courses with heatspring.com that you can link to from his site, and, as well as writing a monthly column for Plumbing and Mechanical magazine. To find Rayhow technical training, go to na.rayhow.com forward slash academy and check out Rayhow America's YouTube channel. Our Twitter handle is at Rayhow, and you can always ask your sales rep for more information about local trainings.